This is the title of my talk. I gave this talk last night at the React London meetup, which was really, really good fun. And um, what happened is I had a really grand plan to build the same app in Ember and React at the same time to get a sense for how they differ. And um, I didn't give myself quite enough time. And I hit this point with React where I'd read all the API docs, but I didn't know the patterns for moving on. I didn't know the best practices for structuring an app. So I just got to this point last night at the React meetup where I ditched my slides and just asked the audience to help me finish you know, the part of the React app I was on, which worked really, really well. Uh, it sort of saved my bacon. And um, I learned quite a lot doing it and learned quite a lot about the different philosophies at the same time, so I wanted to try and you know, communicate a bit of what I learned. So that's me. Um, I look like that everywhere online. I work for these people. Um, I co-organized this, as you know. And I co-wrote this. Um, so actually, this fits in quite well with your talk, Tom. Um, this is from Creativity Inc., which is a book about managing a creative company. And I really, really recommend it. Ed Catmull from Pixar. So I really like this quote. And my point is that our hard problem is how to build rich user interfaces for the browser. And the many good minds trying to solve it are all these people. Um, but I don't have all the time in the world. No one does. So I thought I would focus on these two. And on the surface, they're competitors and philosophically different, but there's a lot of crossover. I think perhaps more than Ember and Angular, Ember and React have a kind of, I don't know, like a, almost a common sense of humor or a common culture to them. So Ryan Florence is a really good example of a kind of a guy who put a lot of um, work and creativity and energy into Ember and now has transferred some of that to React, but taken some of Ember's philosophies with him, which is a really interesting crossover. And he while he's terse and a bit snarky on Twitter, in the end, he, he winds up saying stuff like this. Um, Eric Brin was on a podcast not so long ago talking about going to Facebook and working with Pete Hunt and everyone on the React core team and how much he enjoyed it and how much they had to learn from each other. And Tom Dale and Pete Hunt trade friendly banter from time to time. So they like each other. Um, and I, I want to use both. Like it, they, if the people who like React are so similar in sensibility to the people who like Ember, then I, I think I'd probably like React as well. So I wanted to try it. And more than that, I don't know about all of you people, but when I use any technology, the, the point is not necessarily to adopt it and then make money from using it and applying it. It's more like to take the ideas from it and the mental models and the techniques and take them forward, even if I'm not using the technology just to apply them in everything that comes after. So I was hoping that by um, building this app in tandem with the two frameworks, I'd learn where the gaps in Ember are, where React can help out, and vice versa. So the app was something that is on the surface quite simple. It's just like a little JS bin clone with some files that you can change on the left, an editor in the middle, and the results on the right. And I've built something a bit like this before in Ember last year. It was kind of like a, a JS bin just for Ember. And what's quite nice about building this app is in order to implement this iframe effectively, in order to um, you know, tear down what's already there and spin it back up again efficiently, you have to learn a bit about the build cycle of the framework. So. Um, Bootstrapping these two apps, let's just compare that. So as Rich has shown us, to get an Ember app going now, these days, Ember CLI all the way, install it, new up a new app, it's going to make decisions for you, many, many decisions. It's going to install libraries for you. It's going to tell you where it thinks you should put your files, how it thinks you should test, how it thinks you should implement CSP, all this kind of stuff, which when I presented this to the React audience, knowing that React is, is more of a, a kind of library type uh, ideology where you know, React is a sibling to the other libraries you're using, the, a React developer might, reaction to this might be to be um, disgruntled, like, I don't want this making all these decisions for me. 
But I think the important thing to remember is that these are all decisions which have come from our community. It's not one person deciding it all. And it changes. Like, it moves with the best practices when they come along. And of course, you can just install Ember as a sibling dependency alongside other things, but that's just not the way we've gone on mass as a community. React, on the other hand, um, I generate a package.json in my projects, I install React into it, and then I can use Browserify to require that into my, into my build workflow, whatever that might be. And when I set that up, I used Broccoli Browserify to do it, I was super, super impressed. I'd not I, I knew what Browserify was and how it works and what the point was, but I'd not really had calls to use it on anything. It's really, it's really sweet. And the Ember CLI team have noticed what a nice experience that is. And I think in the not too distant future, you know, you'll be able to just, in one of your Ember source files, your Ember app source files, you'll be able to import from something that's in your package JSON rather than, rather than in your Bower JSON. Um, so this is the build setup I put together for Broccoli, oh, sorry, for, for React with Broccoli. Uh, I thought about trying to use Gulp, but I don't know it, and I do know Broccoli. So I wanted Bower in order to install the Ace editor for that um, code editor in the middle, the Broccoli Browserify library, Broccoli CLI, Broccoli React. Broccoli React is just a Broccoli filter that wraps up React tools, which is the thing that can process JSX files. Actually, I should stop here and just show of hands who's used React to any degree. Two, yeah. Um, React itself, which yeah, it ships statically, but it ships mostly with NPM. Like that's the advisory. They don't advise much about the way you structure your project, but they do advise that you use Browserify in the build. Um, and React Router, which is Ryan Florence's, it's in some ways a port of Ember's router to React land. And I learned something interesting about that notion last night, which I will reflect on in a bit. Uh, and in Bower, all I wanted was Ace Builds, because Ace Builds isn't shipped on NPM. But if it had been, I would use Browserify to bring it in. So um, I wanted my React project to look like my Ember CLI project would, with an app directory and a public directory and all the bits and bobs. So I structured it like this. And um, I'll just walk through how the, the, the Broccoli build pipeline works. So um, the simplest type of broccoli tree is just a path to a directory, which will be copied over into the output. So that's app, gets reactified, so the JSX files get turned into JS files, gets browserified, so you give it that app tree, which has been reactified, and then it's going to resolve all of the require statements all the way through there and bake it down into one output file. Uh, grab the index HTML out, grab app CSS out, um, grab uh, ace out of, well, what I'm actually doing here is grabbing a complete directory of all aces, bits, and bobs out of Bower components. And the reason is because ace editor, I don't know if you've used it, but it's got various different modes and syntax highlighters and themes and stuff you can use. And they're loaded lazily. They're loaded when you switch to that mode. And like the syntax highlighting for JavaScript and the linting is done in a web worker. So you can't really package all of ace up and ship it as one file, you need to let it like go and load its different bits and pieces lazily as it, as it runs. So grab it, stick it in the output directory and the public directory. And a common style sheet so that my React and Ember app look the same. And then merge them all together. And the build output looks something like this. So my, my point of running through this broccoli build is this is not a million miles away from what Ember CLI is doing. Ember CLI is doing much more and is pluggable. Um, but it's hiding away the sort of the steps that go through to producing this output directory. And um, there's no ES6 transpilation in here, but you could easily add it using the same principles that are in Ember CLI. Um, and so to compare that with the Ember CLI output build, it's the same, but with more decisions made for you. And this, this is kind of my, this is sort of the theme of this talk is that Ember makes lots of decisions for you and Ember's, um, Companion tooling makes lots of decisions for you, and the community do. Um, and you might hate that, but you should try it. And similarly, you should try the agnostic world of something like React. So I want to talk about how the app is bootstrapped in either case. Like, what's, what does the sort of top level of the app look like in both cases? So 
for the Ember app, I'm going to treat this as like the application template. What, what does the overall page look like to begin with? <clears throat> so in this case, it's um, one div, which is the pane on the left. And uh, I'm going to say that I'm just going to load the files in as like the model for the top level of the app. So I'm going to each over them and link to them there. And then an outlet in the middle, because that's really all the routes I'm going to go to are going to be the files I want to edit. So that's what's going to go in that outlet. And then the viewer will be some sort of component that encapsulates the idea of an iframe. You shove a load of code into it, and it knows how to reload effectively and efficiently. And you know, so it doesn't. I don't. I have found that using JS Bin, which is a wonderful tool, using something like Ember or, or anything of significant weight, it struggles to reload, you know, cleanly every time, and it's it's just not the nicest experience to play around with. It's good for demoing, like a certain. Um, a certain bit of code and sharing it around, but it's not actually that much fun to live code in. So my top level React component, which I've just called app.jsx, this is what bootstraps the React app, it's kind of similar in, in some sense. So I'm going to get my files from somewhere that populate this app. Maybe I'll drag them out of local storage or a gist or something. Um, go through some process to compile those files that I've, been, that I've been given into the data that gets shoved into the iframe. Um, there's no each helper for React, but you don't need one because what you, can, what you can do is take that collection and map it into the DOM elements that you want to go in. So using JSX, this stuff here gets tra transformed into React virtual DOM nodes, React, React virtual DOM components with this data plumbed into them. Um, you'll see link to there, or oh, it's actually a link uh, tag with a capital L. That comes from React Router. That's not part of React um, Core. And then this is return. This is like the f th that same template, but in React land. So the div on the left with the files mapped using that function that generates a, an li for each one. And then the pane in the middle, and this is the equivalent of outlet in Ember. So. Again, that's, this isn't an, an idiomatic React thing. This is React, React Router, how it handles the idea of like inserting a, a child root into its parent. And then something like that Ember viewer, a, a component that encapsulates the idea of give me some code and I will efficiently re-render. Uh, so routing, so I'm, this is where I'm going to bring up what people at the React meetup told me. So this is my Ember router. And really, this is the important bit. So for all of us here, this is going to feel really, really familiar. There's a file root, and its path is just splat file ID, you know, whatever path you give it. So long as it's not forward slash, it's going to let the file root take over and do what it needs to do and render what it needs to render. <coughs> um, and this is my file root. So I'm taking it as given that the application has all the files. I'm going to grab the one whose ID I've been given if I've managed to find one, then that's the model. If I haven't, then it's a 404, and I'll just go back to the index page and then just a serialized method to make sure the URL knows what to do. So in React land, what Ryan Florence chose to do with the API for React Router is modeled on the idea of embers, but it's modeled as a component. And he chose to, to just like run with the conventions of you know something that will work with JSX just fine. So this is a, the definition of the routing of the app, but like done as components. And you, rather than rendering <coughs> my app component as a top level thing, I render the router. The router doesn't actually, doesn't actually present any elements itself. Instead, it has these, these two handlers, app and file, and they're just classes. Or you know, they're, they're my React components. And in the file that this is in, you'll see them as like var app equals something, var file equals something. And then this is the, technically it's the file component, but for all intents and purposes, it's an, it's an analog of my Ember file root. So um, I grab the file ID from Splat in this case. I, I've had the files passed in. So in my, um, in my sort of overall app template, um, at the point at which I render that child root, I make sure to pass in the files explicitly. It can't reach up and get them. So, I've been given them. I find the one that matches the ID. I'm going to decide what, um, 
what mode the editor should be in based on the extension, and then I'm going to render a, an ace editor component passing in the, the value of the file and the mode I think it should be in, otherwise just a kind of default. So let's talk about that ace editor component. So that's this bit. So ace is just this library that ships and you know you can, it's, it's got an API all of its own which is pretty different from anything in Ember or React. So I think it's, I wanted to just be able to treat it as if it were an input tag or a text area and just kind of plonk it in, bind to on change and consume it that way from the rest of the app and hide away all the complexity of it. So at this point, right, at this point with the React meetup, I wanted to be able to like plow through and show them how, how I'd made each component and how I'd you know, sent the data up through the app. But I, I realized with the React app, I didn't know quite how to do that. So I'm going to switch to live coding mode, if you'll, if you'll forgive me. Uh, OK. So what I want to do is show you that ace editor component in both frameworks and see what you think about how they compare. So um, React on the left, Ember on the right. Is that big enough for everyone? Yeah? Cool. So app, components, ace editor, app, components, ace editor um, will ignore requiring it at the top because it doesn't matter too much. But I mean, I, I guess, you know, it's ES6. This is common JS style require that Browserify knows how to um, resolve. So let's just skip to the parts where we can start to com compare like for like. Mm -hmm. OK, so um, oh, come on. So in Ember, we don't need a render method because we're going to render, well, an ace editor doesn't really have a template. We kind of just need an element to shove it into. And Ember's going to do that for us anyway by default. Um, with React, we do. We have a render, a render function, but it just emits a React virtual div. And then you'll see that React has a component did mount hook, which is exactly the same as Ember's did insert element hook. So this is a moment for you to go, OK, this thing is in the DOM. I can do something with it now. And I'm doing basically exactly the same thing with it in both cases. So um, let's just bring those up side by side. You know, get the element. So in Ember, it's this.get element. In React, it's this.get DOM node. Uh, hook ace into both of those. Um, I'm just setting like a particular feature of ace that I didn't want. <clears throat> and then I'm binding, so ace has its own event system. So I'm just like, I'm encapsulating the idea of binding to that. I want to keep all of knowledge about ace within this one component. So in React, I can just go editor.onChange and then this uh, handle editor change method, its scope will have already been bound to this instance. I don't have to worry about it losing context. Whereas in Ember, I both need to worry about it losing context and I need to worry about it falling outside of the run loop. So you see a run.bind here. And then um, just stash away a reference to editor on both sides. Now, on the React side, I then call component did update. So the component did update hook, what that's telling you is um, new data came in, right? But because all I'm rendering out of this component is just this div, and I'm not binding any of the props that have been given to me to the div. React doesn't know to redraw, so it's up to me to do something when new data comes in. And that's what this is going to do. So um, update the theme, update the mode, update the, the value, and these just wrap around you know, whatever ACES interfaces for doing these things. Um, but in essence, uh, Ember has these same things. Like, I, I have these exact same methods in the Ember side. But in the Ember side, I'm using observers instead. So rather than using a hook and then calling out to these methods, 
imperatively, I'm sort of just declaring that these are going to listen out for when I've created an editor and set it, or when I change the mode, or both, this hook is going to get run. And assuming that I've got both these things, I can set the mode on the editor, set the theme on the editor. So it's just this difference between um, what maybe is arguably simpler in React land, that you've just got a hook, and you just like very explicitly say what happens there. In Ember, you could kind of do the same thing if you wanted to, but I've chosen to use the the more idiomatic thing of using observers and uh, annotating these functions so they get called at the right time. Um, there's a bit of fun with this particular type of component in, on both sides of the fence because, so I want to update the value of the editor whenever a new value comes in from the outside. Um, and also in the, um, yeah, basically that. So whenever a new value comes in from the outside, I want to call this dot set value on the editor. And then also, when you do set value on ace for some reason, it will highlight it all. So I just want to kill that off. But um, when you, so you remember up the top, I said I was um, binding to on change and handling that event. So um, when I call set value, it's going to trigger on change. And in my Ember app, at least, and in fact, on both sides of this. So if you can follow the logic here, which I'm sure you can. When I call on change, it's going to get the value off the editor and set it as my value. And that, that will propagate out via Ember's bindings. Um, but this is going to get called, because this is listening out for if value changes as well. So it's going to set the value on the editor, which is going to trigger change again, which is going to trigger value again. And it's going to end up in a cycle. So I just have to check, you know, have I are they identical, in which case you don't need to set the value on the editor anymore. And the same thing would happen in the React side, except that at this point, I wasn't quite sure. Like In Ember, when I, when I use my component, so in my file template, I've got an ace editor, and I bind the value to it. And that binding says, whenever, whenever the value changes from either end, they'll remain identical. And so Ember takes care of, like, getting the data out of the component and up into anywhere else that it's used. But in React, there's, there's no such facility, and that's on purpose. They, the claim is that two-way data bindings become really difficult to conceptualize really quickly. Um, and they want this idea that you can, you can consider your app as a, a single function. And if you call it with the same set of data, it will always render the same UI. Whereas in Emberland, you know, you're more thinking about um, Almost it more, of a, more as a living system, where things contain their own states, and you, you just trust Ember to plumb it all together. So this was where I got to the point of, of being like, well, OK, so in my file component, I'm using this editor component. Um, and it's a binding as well. It's, it isn't a binding. So this value equals file.value isn't going to guarantee for me that the file's values change, the, file, the file's value gets changed. It's just passing it down. And it's up to me to set a handler for this component and then do something when that handler triggers and then probably propagate it up. So I was kind of at this point where I was like, so to the audience, you know, it makes sense to me that you know, this, uh, this, is, this is act like an input. It's going to trigger a change event. Do I bubble it through the DOM? Do I, you know, where, where, how far up the, the stack of things do I send this event in order to handle it and then sort of alert everything else of that change? Because that's the idea. You kind of let a change bubble up and then tell, go, go up as far as you need to and then sort of let the changes propagate back down again. And the bit of advice I was given by a kind audience member was that if you've got various things which rely on a piece of data, you want to go to their closest common an ancestor. So this is quite simple. You know, there's the editor and the viewer, or sorry, the, the file component and the viewer over on the right. And they both need to know about the file's value. Or in, in fact, they, the viewer needs to know about the compiled value of all the files. But um, so the change only needs to go as far up as the app itself. So what I ended up with 
with the help of the audience was, um, let's follow this through. So when Ace tells us that things have changed, we're going to, um, if we've been given a handler for the on-change event, just call it with the new value of what's in, what's in this editor. That's going to go up to the file component, which isn't going to mutate any data. It's not going to mess with the file that it's been given to work with. That's, that's not what it's there for. It's just going to carry on propagating that change, but with a bit more information. So it's saying um, the message we want to pass up to the top is this file has changed, and this is its new value. So I'm, I get to sort of um, embellish that on change message with something else. And then it winds up in, in app.js. So you'll see that I've got my, um, effectively, my file root also has an on change handler. So you can kind of think, it, uh, if I wasn't using the router, I might be inclined to just do um, something like this. You get the gist. It's kind of equivalent. So that's going to come up. I'm going to. So this is quite interesting as well. So as I was going through this, so in Ember, we are very quick to mutate objects. Bindings, the promise of binding, bindings is that we're not going to leave a bit of state somewhere unattended. Like any change you make is going to propagate correctly and get to all the right places. But what the audience at React Meetup were telling me was, don't mutate state. If you want to like, pour some new data down into your, your, into your virtual DOM, you want to produce a new set of files with this change. So effectively, I'm doing a kind of like half-assed data sharing thing here. So I want to produce a new collection of files if the and I'm, I'm going to do that by mapping the old collection to produce a new array. If the file I'm on in that map function matches the one you know, that I've just received notification about, I'm going to return a new, mutate, uh, like a, a new version of that file. And for the rest of them, I'll return the original instance. So if you imagine, it's not, um, it's not like copying every single file in the array. It's just creating a new array with references to all the files that haven't changed and one reference to the one, the one new file that has changed. So this is where with React, you could use an immutable data structure for this and get these really cheap copies of objects and get your undo history and things like that. So if I was using Mori or Ancient Oak or one of those libraries, I could probably you know, have much ter a much terser way of saying, go modify, like produce me a new set of files by modifying this file. And it would know just to like, share all the memory it, it you know share all the memory it can and then set state is the point at which things actually get re-rendered re so you're saying i want to change the state of things and my change is that files is now this new files object and that's going to trigger everything to be re-rendered and i don't know i don't really want to talk too much on react virtual dom and the reconciliation and the way it renders but um it's worth looking into. It's impressive what they've done in terms of removing the complication of two-way bindings. In that you, the, the React philosophy is that when you make one of these changes, you can treat it almost as if you're refreshing the browser. Like it's like, rather than worrying about, oh, have I put this component in this kind of state and this one and the other, and when I, it's just like. It's as if you're re-rendering the whole thing from scratch, but really you're not. You're only making the minimal set of changes to the actual living DOM. So um, it, I was really pleased to get to that point, and I'll show you what the app looks like. It's, it's nothing to write home about, but um, So I've not implemented the viewer yet, because actually that was one of the less complicated parts. The viewer I've written before, and you can just po use post message to send stuff into the iframe. And then interestingly, so in, in an Ember app, what you would want to do is discover there's an existing Ember app, call destroy on it, which is actually a very cheap way to just like 
stop a running Ember app in its tracks and just like turn it off, and then you can just dump it to get rid of it and instantiate the new one. With React, I, I think it's the case that um, I would just, it would almost be like I was just getting a function passed in, and I would just be able to call this function. Well, in React, what you do is you, um, you mount a node on a particular point in the DOM, so I'd mount it on the body, and doing that would not only you know, refresh, refresh what's, whatever's in the viewer, but it would do so cheaply. It wouldn't need to worry about the fact that there was already an existing React app there. It would just kind of um, make the minimal set of changes necessary to get from my previous app to my new app. But the point was that you know, now I've got an editor wherein you know, my, my call changes to my file, you, you know, they, they really do affect a file somewhere. But actually, and I, I found this really fascinating, the idea that what I've got here, if I was using an immutable data structure, I could have an undo history almost for free here because with each change that I add, I'm producing a new copy of my starting collection of files with as much as can be brought over, brought over each time, or, you know, shared memory. Um, so I think that'd be a quite a nice next experiment. And then, obviously, compiling a React app in the browser from different bits of JSX should be possible, I would have thought. I think you can run, you'd have to, um, things you were referring to, like React, you'd have to make sure they were available, things you were requiring. But apart from that, I think it shouldn't be too hard. And similarly with Ember, you know, you can run the ESX transpiler in browser. There's no reason you couldn't, you know, take all the files in that list and kind of run them through a similar process to Ember CLI, but in the browser. So one final takeaway related to these different these differing philosophies that are so fascinating between whoop, between Ember at React so, and Ember and React. So after the talk, I was having a conversation with one of the people who'd helped me out, and he said, it's really interesting that you used React Router. And he said that he and his team had tried it, but they found it too tied to React. And they ended up using something that was completely separate, just a sibling JavaScript library. And then the two you know, could, could interact in any way they wanted. And I think that's an interesting difference in philosophy. He kind of said to me, um, he, to paraphrase, he said, would I be right in thinking that you, you kind of, the Ember way of doing things is you look for a library which already plays nicely with Ember, something that plugs into Ember's ecosystem. And I said, yeah, that's, that's pretty true. Things are nicer if it all kind of follows the same conventions. And he said, oh, okay, cool, that's interesting. In React, React is just another little library that you use. It's not, it really isn't a framework. And in fact, um, I believe at one point there was an experiment to use React as Ember's view layer or Ember's sort of rendering layer. And I could see how that could work. You could slot React in. You could even build like a React component and just pass state into it from a larger Ember app. So um, I, I want to sort of give this talk again in the future and finish the app on all of that. But already, I feel like I've learned stuff about React, which I can use already in Ember apps. And I've already started to see ways that I, that I can take my Ember predispositions if I were going to do a React app and make use of them, certainly in terms of bindings, like how to get change events up to whatever the root data structure is so it can, it can travel down again. But um, the other thing I want to say is that uh, the React meetup group was a really, really lovely bunch of people. You might remember we had Stuart Harris, who runs that group, come and talk here a couple months ago, which is why I went and talked there. So I'd encourage all of you to go along and check it out. So uh, that's me. Any questions? Why is your uh, localhost a localhost? I typoed that so many times that I figured it would be worth just aliasing it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's in the it's, it's in the host files. Yeah, yeah. Cool. The question um, with does does React not have like a, a run loop or anything that keeps saying it's just kind of you do something and then the state stays like that until the handler happens? So luckily, because I was at the meetup last night, I can answer this question 
with some intelligence. So the guy who spoke after me gave a really good answer to this. So uh, React has batching of operations, and um, it's, it's pluggable. So there are various different ways you can handle it. And I'm fairly sure you could handle it with Backburner if you wanted to. So um, the default strategy is that any time you make a modification, it will trigger a re-render sort of at that point. There's an alternative strategy you can use, I think, either out of the box or by using a library called React Add-ons, um, which is, you might have heard of this in relation to Ohm, um, where you use request animation frame. So what happens is, um, it was really, really clever to think about. So you've got a bunch of changes which could trigger re-renders. And rather than doing them kind of um, uh, synchronously, you kind of queue them up to get done in the next request animation frame. So you, it's like, this change has happened. Uh, I want to cause a re-render. I'm going to therefore request an animation frame and stick it in there. And you're going to do that as many times as you can before you hit that request animation frame. You'll get there after 60, 60 milliseconds. It will flush all those changes into the DOM, and then you'll have another 60 millisecond period in which to do to like move data around in JavaScript before the next flush. And because it's request an, because it's request animation frame, it's, yeah, it's 60 fps. You know, it, it should users shouldn't be able to see it. Like it'll be as high fidelity as the browser can render animation wise. For another question. Yeah. <laughs> That's the, well, maybe I'm just seeing it, the handler for your unchanged with the ace editor, is that firing every key press? Or when, does it, when does it change? Yeah, I think ace does fire every key press. So that's a lot of re-saving the same value. Each yeah. Time someone, it goes, bubbles up, set, recreates a list with everything the same except the value, yeah, and yeah. then sends it down again. Yeah, yeah. I'd probably, I would probably be inclined to debounce it so that you, know, you have to, it, in order to actually send a change event out of that ace editor component, you've got to be idle for 250 milliseconds or something like that, just to give it a chance to to work. I'd be very interested to see how React and Ember differ, particularly in this application, um, with memory over a long period of time. Memory usage, yeah. Because React's sort of mindset, from what I can gather, is that um, obviously don't keep too many things around. But diffs are fine. Keep them. Keep them from as long as you want. Replay them. Pass them around. Mm -hmm. Whereas Ember's obviously immutable and do as little as possible to change and then that'll get rebound. So for things, long-lived applications in React, I'd be quite interested to see how the, the performance cost of React mindset. Yeah, so the diffs. So, so obviously what, once React is... Once you've got the application to a point, it just stays still, yeah. in theory, with React. Whereas Ember, it's kind of alive and breathing. Yeah. But then on certain different situations, React is obviously constantly changing. Yeah. For, you imagine something like uh, an analytics platform that's doing everything sort of every minute. It's obviously churning, creating a lot of objects, whereas Ember would probably be reusing the objects a little bit Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting point. So yeah, in Ember, you would... So like Gmail, for instance, it would be quite an interesting sort of the performance costs of the different mindsets. Would yeah, so I think, and this is interesting because, so I guess my wider point is that Ember, um, Ember not only has very strong suggestions about how you, how you should structure an application, but it, it codifies them. Its APIs are its best practices, whereas with React it makes no such suggestions directly in the APIs, but, you know, it's all about removing complexity, this is, this is like the rhetoric of the uh, React team, and um, part of that is this referential transparency, the idea that you, you can consider your app a function which, given the same input, always produces the same markup out the end. Um, and they, 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 they sort of see the same qualities in immutable data structures, so that you, know, you, don't, you don't run the risk of having mutated, something mutating your starting set of data in a weird way. So there was like a temptation for me in my file component when that change comes up to just go, oh, well, you know, I've got this file object to handle already. I'll just mutate it. Yeah. In Ember, you, you certainly would do that. In fact, you do it without thinking because you just bind them up in the template and it, things are taken care of. 
and react to the idea as, is that that could come back to bite you. You could mutate something when you don't mean to. Better to let the changes bubble up. And you know, you wouldn't have to use immutable data structures. I could have just performed an in-place mutation. Mm -hmm. But as I was typing that in the room last night, people were like, <laughs> there's a hiss. <laughs> no, don't mutate stuff. Yeah. And I, I see the point. I think there's, there's value in both ways. But interestingly, the guy who gave the talk explaining the batching, he'd come from a, um, uh, a world of building native applications, kind of stuff in Cocoa, in right. C and Objective-C. And he, he was really curious to see how far this React model will go in terms of performance. Like the idea of effectively you're re-rendering everything every time. It's just that you're not actually changing the whole DOM every time. Because when you, when, you, when you trigger a re-render on your topmost React element, every component below it, its render function is going to get called to. And if you do expensive stuff, in any of those render functions, or even if you do cheap stuff but it adds up to expensive, you're going to run that every time. So it's like, in Ember, you can hamstring yourself by creating way too many complex bindings to make things start to churn. And I think in React, you run no risk of doing that, but you do run the risk of you know, doing too much work in render functions and then needing to strategically move it to other places and instruct React. Yeah, which things should really be re but re -render. React would be a lot more obvious because there'll be a sort of whole page paint refresh. Yes, yeah, like that. Whereas with Ember, it would be a little flickering yellow thing in the corner or a red thing. You're like, what the hell is that? Oh, it's just this timer that I've got yeah, accidentally yeah. bound to some div. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah complexity would creep in surreptitiously with Ember and with, um, with, yeah, like you say, with React. I think the code you end up writing with React is, is simpler, simpler at first yeah. blush. If you're familiar with JavaScript, it just looks like regular JavaScript, whereas Ember looks like almost, almost like another language. Yeah, that's. No, So I ask people about Flux mainly, which is, um, which is interesting. It kind of goes hand in hand with React, but it's not a framework or a library per se. It's a pattern for how you, for how you handle that kind of thing about the thing outside of the rendering part. Like how do you get changes of state flowing nicely through this application? So people spoke about Flux, but they spoke about it in uncertain terms. They were, they, People kind of said they weren't totally sold on that yet. Some people said they were using React as the rendering engine for Backbone, basically. Um, no one spoke about anything really more than that in terms of MVC patterns. I think everyone enrolled their own, from what I, what I could tell. People were talking very cheerfully about um, taking their React app and rendering it on the server, which is very painless. You can take your same React virtual DOM and render it to a string and just send it down the wire. Um, so that's interesting. And I think uh, HTML bars promises to be able to do some of the same. But um, it's, I don't know. That it's, a guy gave a talk on it and demonstrated some really, really nice qualities being able to do that. Render your, you know, your rich client app on the server first so you can, get, so you can get markup in people's hands before the actual JavaScript has started doing its thing. But it sort of feels like a bit of a stopgap. You know, it's like a, a hack to get things rolling while we've got um, you know, uh, high latency internet connections. All right, shall we go to the pub? Yeah. <laughs>